I'm not okay, you're not okay, but that's okay. Using Eternal Principles to Heal Traumatized Relationships by Maurice W. Harker, read by Sarah Schneider. Introduction. When I first studied, started studying psychological principles back in my late teens and early 20s, it was, the, with, it was with the intent to improve my own understanding of and skills in relationships. I had been a decent guy with good parents, but any young woman who dated me would tell you I had a lot of work to do in order to understand healthy relationships. I started with books out of the self-help section of the bookstore. I found some books that were not so great. I also found some books that have benefited me for my whole life. See Appendix A. My interest in becoming a marriage therapist grew. After spending two years in Detroit, Michigan as a missionary, I returned to the University of Utah and changed my major from engineering to psychology. I kept reading self-help books, I studied the psychological philosophies of scientists with great diligence, and I dated my heart out, even if I left a trail of tears while doing so. Along the way, I had a sneaking suspicion that I should probably keep myself connected to the teachings of prophets, both modern and ancient. I am not a fast reader, so I am glad I discovered audio cassettes. It was 1990 at the time. I forced myself to listen to conference talks and scriptures almost constantly when I was commuting to and from work, school, and home. Just so you know, this was not enjoyable for me, but I had been a serious athlete in high school, and I understood that training your brain would feel similar to training your body. It does not feel great while doing it, but with persistence, the feeling after getting in shape is unforgettable. If you are going to acquire the strength and skill to do your part in healing a traumatized relationship, you will need to get good at reading, listening, reading slash listening to inspired literature. It started to become clear to me that notwithstanding the valiant efforts of the scientists, there were gaps and inaccuracies to their philosophies as I tried to apply them in my dating relationships and then marriage. This became increasingly obvious once I became a real therapist and started working directly with couples. The more I interviewed couples and the more I tried both scientific ideas versus eternal principles, the more the eternal principles proved their validity. The good news <clears throat> is that there are many scientific principles that are pointed in the right direction. It is not hard to find many and use them as I help people understand what they are experiencing and find direction on how to proceed. But in the end, the practical application of inspired principles tends to be more useful and effective. What you will be reading in this book is a set of principles that bridge the gap between scientific and spiritual principles. Uh, principles relating to healthy and healing relationships, primarily marriages. If you do not have confidence in the idea that people can receive principles directly from God through revelation about such things, then you may want to save time by not reading this book. I invite those who believe in the concept of personal revelation to take all the ideas you read here and ask for a second witness on whether or not what I teach is true. I have worked very hard to make sure what I teach is true, but you are entitled to your own confirmations. Part 1. Healthy Relationships, the Ideal. I want to start by describing the, quote, perfect relationship, and then we can talk about what goes wrong along the way, followed by what to do about it. Dependent stage. An ideal relationship starts even before the marriage begins. Ideally, we are each born to decent parents who at least try to be good parents. We are initially dependent upon them. I am convinced that their inaccuracies are actually part of the plan. It seems that most of us have an innate craving for our parents to be perfect. As we enter adolescence, their imperfections become more obvious and more inconvenient. Ideally, as we grow in our awareness of our earthly parents' imperfections, we are becoming increasingly aware of our heavenly parents' perfections. Ideally, we do not let the imperfections of our earthly parents sour our development. Ideally, we do not blame them. We begin the process of learning from their strengths and weaknesses. We begin to loosen our connection with them at the same time that we increase our connection with God. Independent stage. From our mid-teens to our mid-twenties, ideally we use this newly developing relationship with God to individuate from our earthly parents. We become strong and functional individuals emotionally, psychologically, socially, physically, financially, and spiritually. Eric Erickson has a great description of this stage that he calls identity versus identity diffusion, which establishes a foundation for the next phase, intimacy versus isolation. 
If done right, we can gain the ability to use our parents as a resource without depending on them. Along the way, we become increasingly capable of giving back to them, thus turning the relationship into something mutually beneficial. Men and women who work hard during this young adult stage become increasingly attractive to each other. Throughout this book, I will refer to independence. I want to clarify that this means independent of relying on people, not independent from God. Do not rely upon the arm of flesh, 2 Nephi 4.43. I am working on another book designed specifically to help individuals solidify and re-solidify their personal development. Independent stage versus codependency. Notwithstanding how much happiness one can experience after becoming a highly functional, self-actualizing, according to Maslow, individual, we have planted deeply within us a drive to enter relationships. I am convinced that this drive is a gift from God designed to create and maintain eternal families. It bothers me that many scientists have described this inability to be happy by oneself, as a sign of codependency. This has caused a hesitance in many good and healthy people to pursue marriage. I make this point to correct and clarify for those who are wondering whether or not they have, a, they have codependent tendencies versus interdependent tendencies, a portion of what I call, quote, celestial orientation. The best way to clarify is to observe, am I capable of being independent? Have I demonstrated that I can do that? Uh, remember, this is a demonstration of one's ability to function well in all areas without relying on people. There is an understanding that there is still a reliance on God and His words. The Four Seasons of a Healthy, Growing Relationship As you might guess, when two people meet who are both functioning high on the independent scale, they are quite often very attractive to one another. Highly independent people tend to be highly attractive. In an ideal situation, season one, courtship, begins when they meet. The two have different goals during this phase. The man works to demonstrate his confidence and competence in his ability to provide safety and security for the woman. The woman works to discern whether or not the man is capable of providing sufficient safety and security while working to be edifying and nurturing equal to the level he provides safety and security. This dating stage often looks fun from the outside and the media has certainly glorified the experience, but for most it is laced with as much anxiety as it is with thrill. If the two find each other sufficiently edifying, the relationship transitions into season two, connection. There are other names for this stage, like the honeymoon stage. This stage begins when a commitment is made between the two because they both want to experience a strong connection, intimacy with each other. This could be as small as holding hands and as big as temple covenants that would bring with it a full dose of spiritual, emotional, and physical intimacy. This, by far, is the most enjoyable phase of the relationship cycle. I invite all who are in this phase to savor it in the savor it the best you can for as long as you can. Season three, collapse. But inevitably, not because someone wants to ruin it, but because two developing and growing humans are involved, they will gradually and accidentally start to become mismatched. I love Shel Silverstein's book, The Missing Piece Meets the Big O. I highly recommend you get a copy and read it ASAP. It only takes about 10 minutes to read, and it is great to read to youth. There are some important concepts to learn from this book, but it too has a missing piece. The moral of his story is that it is important to not look for someone who, quote, completes you, unquote, but to become complete on your own, then roll through life with someone who is also complete. Before reaching this glorious conclusion, he describes a relationship that does not end well. He beautifully describes the unfortunate scenario of two pieces that fit well together at the beginning, completing each other, but begin to not fit so well together if one or both begins to grow. The most salient moment is when one piece says to the other, quote, I didn't know you would grow. The other piece replies, quote, I didn't know either, unquote. When two people provide an edifying environment for each other, both will grow. But it is not an automatic process that they will grow to fit each other better. In my mind, I see the wheels of a mechanical clock. When they first are placed next to each other, they fit nicely. But imagine if one or both of the wheels or cogs begin to grow. After a while, they wouldn't fit together so well anymore. Remember the old playground game, The Three-Legged Race? Two people might run well as individuals, and for a time run well with one leg tied to one leg of their partner, but very often, when that close together, they can accidentally and incidentally trip each other up. This third stage is when the smooth flow of the relationship begins to fall apart. 
Because of all the good times the two have had together, one or both are desperate to keep the relationship from un unraveling, because it appears that if it starts to fall apart, the only conclusion is that it will come to an end for sure. The mistake I watch couples make is that if they start to see this happen, they try to return it back to the condition it was in during season two. Quote, let's go back to the way things were before, unquote. That seems like a logical conclusion, but this cannot be done because the individuals have grown and matured as individuals as well. I, see, I saw a movie that had a marriage therapist encouraging a couple to use the memory of the origins of the relationship as a way to re-spark the relationship. A skilled therapist will see that this is not going to work. Something different is needed because they are two different, hopefully more developed people in the relationship now. They will need to go through stage four if the relationship is going to recover and grow. Season four, the born again relationship. I attribute my understanding of this fourth season to my awareness of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I have not found the idea anywhere in any textbook or self-help book that I have ever read. I remember reviewing Alma 5 one day and several of the marital relationships I had been working with at the time that were on the verge of death came to mind. As a missionary in Detroit, I learned a, a bit of the Bible Belt language. They use the term, quote, born again, unquote, a lot more than in the Mormon community where I grew up. Alma 5, especially verse 26, addresses this concept. In the language I would use among the people of Detroit, this verse can be translated to mean, quote, I know you have been born again before, but have you been born again lately? Unquote. I had been using this principle with individuals in therapy for some time, but now the idea of its application of marriages, or its application to marriages, flooded into my mind. A piece of this concept that flowed into my mind comes from the New Testament. There are two stories that teach a similar principle. Matthew 9.24 says, He said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. And then John 11.11 it says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may wake him out of sleep. Christ said this even though he already knew that Lazarus was dead. In both cases, Christ went on to demonstrate that whether an individual is dead for a short period of time or for longer, if one assesses the power of God with a mustard seed of faith, they can be raised from the dead. It took a bit of revelation to make it clear to me that if God can do this with individuals, then he can do it with marriages. I have many couples who have come to me and asked after a first visit, is our marriage fixable? I try to be honest with them about how devastated I perceive the relationship to be, but then share with them the principle from Mark 9.23. Jesus said unto him, If thou, both the husband and the wife, canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. The individuals may need to respond the same way the father did in verse 24. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. In order to begin the born-again process of a relationship, the individuals, as they enter season four, are going to have to use a similar process to what happened, uh, to what helped them prepare for season one originally, to move success successfully from the dependent stage to the independent stage. Each individual needed to create an attachment to God and use that relationship to grow into a strong individual. The same process will be needed to complete season four thus laying a foundation for the relationship to be born again. Using the first three steps of the 12 Steps program for personal and relationship development. In my young adult years, I became very dedicated to learning how to prepare myself for a successful marital relationship. I learned that I would need to become very strong as an individual. I learned that to become strong as an individual, I would need a strong relationship with God. I found a slight translation of the first three steps of the long-standing 12 steps programs to hold the basics of what I needed. I have learned that these steps can be a resource to everyone. Step 1, quote, we admit that we are powerless and that our lives have become unmanageable, unquote. My translation, quote, I admit that I am in over my head and that the challenge before me is more than I can handle on my own, unquote. Humility. Step two, quote, came to believe a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity, unquote. My translation, quote, I need to remember there is a power greater than me that can provide the resources necessary for me to succeed against this challenge, unquote. Hope. Step three, made the decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him, unquote. My translation, 
quote, as with any team, I need to get myself in sync with his methods. I need to follow instructions even when they don't make complete sense to me because he has the bigger picture. I need to get to know his methods based on all the literature written by those who have been in contact with him, prophets, and I need to invite interaction with him, prayer, and I need to make my best guess on how to proceed based on what I have read and my inspired inclinations. I need to rely o only on my relationship with God to gain or regain emotional and psychological stability instead of relying on a human, my spouse, unquote. In order to get from the end of season three to the beginning of season one successfully, both individuals will, will need to regain full, quote, spiritual integrity, unquote. This is a term I use to describe the condition of an individual when they have everything right about themselves with God. They clean all of their own sins out of their system. They learn to respond to difficult situations with dignity, eliminating all anger and sarcasm, etc. And they remember that with this relationship with God, they can live with or without the other person. In other words, they are getting all of their, quote, needs, unquote, met by a divine source. It is not a requirement for them to become perfect, but it is a requirement that they become born again or good with God. So, in season four, ironically, the individuals need to spend less time working on the marriage and more time working on themselves as individuals via their relationship with God. I encourage individuals to use any inspired resource they can to help facilitate this process. I encourage them to find what worked before and use it again, plus any new tools they have learned over the years. If they do not have a system they are confident in, I encourage them to use the three steps I described above. It is in this fourth season where I am most often used in marriage therapy. I work very hard when I assess that a relationship is in season three to help it enter and get through season four in a constructive way. The process of helping individuals become born again as individuals and then go on to experience a born again marriage is very meticulous and only a God can do it correctly. So I must remember that the role I play is more like a surgeon's assistant than the master surgeon himself. It is one thing to help an individual identify the next steps of personal development and progress with them. It is quite another thing to help two individuals identify their individual improvements in such a way that when they complete the development, it actually makes them more compatible instead of less compatible. Clinicians and couples who focus on, quote, individual happiness supersedes marital happiness, unquote, without involving God in the process are at risk of killing the marriage permanently. By aligning the process with God, both the evolution of the individuals and the evolution of the marriage can be attended to at the same time. We have learned from the, revelation, uh, from the revelations of prophets and seconded by many in personal revelation that God is very invested in keeping families together. If both individuals will recommit to staying connected to God, then it is just a matter of time before the marriage is raised from the dead. To get through season four, both individuals must turn their attention more to their individual relationship with God than to their relationship with each other. If the couple is able to continue living together, they need to be courteous and kind to each other, but not turn to each other to, quote, meet their needs, unquote. In 2 Nephi 4.34, Nephi says, quote, O Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. Yea, cursed is he that putteth, putteth his, arm, his trust in man, or maketh flesh his arm, unquote. And Exodus, chapter 20, verse 3, shares a familiar phrase, quote, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, unquote. During season 4, it is important that both individuals relearn that they need to avoid relying on another person, their spouse, for emotional and psychological and spiritual stability. The idea that we should rely on a fellow man who has developmental issues of, the, of their own for such things is another ridiculous idea taught by some psychologists. Sometimes one of the individuals achieves, quote, born again, unquote, faster than the other. Sometimes this process is not about becoming a better person, but about being healed from the injuries experienced by the misbehaviors of the other or someone in the past. If we recall, there are a few stories in the scriptures about the same power that can raise people from the dead that can also be helped, also be used to help heal people. While one individual is working to overcome patterns of hurtful behavior during season four, the other is working to recover from such hurtful behavior. Unfortunately, it is not uncommon that both have to do both, repent and heal. 
See Double Burn Victim Scenario later on in this book. If one individual reaches the born-again experience before the other, I invite them to consult with God using their newly fine-tuned relationship with Him as to whether to move on to a phase of life without the partner, see Pioneer Woman Mode, or to wait for them, see Parable of the Southern Bell. When the two finally complete their re-individuation or born-again process, they begin Season 1 again. The New Season 1, Recourtship. Because the two have been doing quite a bit of individual work, they have the opportunity to learn a lot of new things about each other. The get-togethers of this stage should be mostly encouraged by the man in order to re-establish the patriarchal order. Trust starts out low in the same way it does in the first season one. Ideally, both individuals will work to build trust with the other with the same ambition as was used before. He takes brave, vulnerable steps toward her. She replies with appropriate encouragement. He works to help her feel safe and secure. She works to help him feel confident and competent. There is a new thrill, a bit more sober than last time, in getting to know this new person, unless one or both of the individuals is having a hard time letting the spouse be a different born-again person. After the right amount of time and proving oneself with and for each other, the couple has the opportunity to enter a new and even more glorious season too. Even in non-traumatized relationships, I expect couples to go through these four seasons on a regular basis. Each time they go through the four seasons, they should notice that the quality of their relationship and the quality of each individual is improving. They should start to gain confidence in the cycle of the four seasons as we do with the four seasons we experience on this earth. It is okay to not look forward to the fall and the winter, but to do the work inside yourself during these seasons uh, so you can more thoroughly enjoy the seasons of spring and summer.